I'd like to uh, acknowledge my uh, co-authors on this research, Michael Bertolacci and Andrew Samit Manjon at the University of Wollongong. And um, let's, let's move on. Uh, look, uh, this is in honor of Pat Moran. Um, Pat was uh, really uh, an amazing uh, person and very, very instrumental to the health and strength of statistics in Australia. Uh, there's a little bio data on Pat. Um, the Australian Stat Society uh, in their wisdom, uh, chose to name the Moran Lecture uh, as of 2016. And Sue Wilson was the inaugural Moran Lecturer. Um, I'm very honoured to be in such great company. Um, uh, just a personal note that I, I started with um, Pat uh, on a PhD uh, before I went overseas. Uh, it was one of those cases where you started a PhD and then you got offers from Northern Hemisphere places. And um, so I had six months of, of working with Pat and it was really very enjoyable. So, um, so I know Pat a little bit, uh, which, um, which is great. So let's see. Um, look, uh, I'm gonna take you on um, a little bit of a journey. Uh, the journey starts in the fields of Rothamsted uh, and it ends up um, at 700 kilometers above Earth's surface. And then eventually we're gonna get back to Earth and uh, talk about carbon dioxide and, and how it might be um, studied uh, in order to deal with uh, an impending climate, climate crisis. So um, you just saw uh, those um, fields at Rothamsted now I'm going to show you uh, something that doesn't look anything like those fields, uh, but it's the sort of thing that we see in geophysics a lot, where people uh, are running multi-model ensembles, and here there are 42 of them, um, each one having different ideas about uh, resolution of uh, exchanges of heat and uh, water in different um, parts of the Earth, um, but largely driven by um, uh, a climate projection um, that talks about the amount of increase in carbon dioxide and the consequence of that on our temperature. So, um, so what you see there are 42 models. Um, historically, uh, these actually clump quite well, um, but as we go out into the future, there's quite a lot of diversity in those models. So let's take a look at uh, the analysis of variance because these two uh, problems could be considered uh, within that framework. And what we do in statistics, of course, is think of, um, of, of quite generic problems that might be used in different places. Of course, Fisher was motivated by the fields of Rothamsted and analysis of variance there. But uh, these ideas have worked their way into industrial manufacturing and computer experiments, and then really relatively recently in geophysics. So um, multi-model ensembles, uh, an example of which you've just seen, uh, gives us an idea of what's happening in the middle and in the extremes. And another name for this set of experiments where people use different um, assumptions but generally guided by a protocol that all members uh, hold to is a model into comparison project or a MIP. And, and there have been ANOVA and non-ANOVA approaches to combining outputs from the MIP. Um, and uh, they are reviewed in a, in a paper which um, has, is being uh, put up in archive, on archive within the next week or two. So just recall this two-way ANOVA model, very simple, no interaction. Uh, in a MIP, instead of having one set of data, uh, we actually have capital J sets of data, data. And in the example I showed you, J was 42. And um, the question is, what are we gonna do about having 42 observations? What has traditionally been done in a MIP is that some sort of central tendency has been reported. Um, extremes or quantiles, upper and lower uh, quantiles have been reported out of the MIP. 
to give an idea of the diversity, um, but really not much more than that uh, from a stats point of view. Uh, some of these papers that have been appearing since the 2010s have actually attempted to do something along those lines. And in our yet to be put up archive paper, we reviewed those um, and we've added our, um, our attempt here using a full analysis of variance. One consensus estimate is simply to take the average of all the YKLs in this case uh, rather than looking for some, some sophisticated way to weight them. Um, and that is certainly uh, the easiest. Uh, but then the question is, or at least statisticians ask the question, what is the variance of that uh, quantity? In which case, you know, we need some sort of model. We're not into just exploratory or summary statistics. We're now doing statistics with a capital S, which means we're doing statistical inference. Um, we're involved in, in a MIP actually, and um, this work that I'm presenting to you uh, was presented to the groups uh, who, who are involved in this model into comparison experiment. And in the end, a vote was taken and uh, the simple straight average won, uh, won the vote, um, which keeps life simple. Um, no particular team in the MIP is given more weight than any other. And so there's some democracy involved in this one team, one vote. Look, I'd like to just give you an idea of the carbon cycle. I'm not gonna leave it on for long, but essentially what happens is um, there's not a lot of uh, uh, chemical reactions of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. They're not really many sources. It's very, very small. Most of the carbon dioxide that we have in the atmosphere, which is a leading greenhouse gas, by the way. Most of those uh, that is coming from Earth's surface. And this is a representation of some of the sources and sinks of carbon dioxide. Um, data has been relatively uh, sparse um, for fluxes. Uh, I'm gonna call them fluxes now, which is the exchange of carbon dioxide at Earth's surface. Um, and it is a, in a unit of, say, petagrams of carbon per year. Um, data are relatively sparse. Um, there are instruments in, on stations, weather stations in different parts of the world. Um, they're in the nose cones of aircraft. They're also on ships uh, tracking across the oceans. Um, but as you can imagine, in the large space-time cube, it is a relatively sparse source of data. So um, a, uh, there have been um, launches of satellites uh, to gain uh, world global coverage of carbon dioxide. Uh, the first launch uh, was in 2009, um, but unfortunately that launch failed. That was OCO, Orbiting Carbon Observatory. Very soon after the Japanese launched, uh, and they launched a satellite called GOSAT, that was successful. Um, but the, um, the, the NASA got another shot and uh, on 2nd of July, 2014, we're almost at our seven year anniversary now, um, this particular satellite was launched on a Delta II rocket. Um, and so here's the sort of coverage uh, that you can get. Uh, you get very good global coverage, uh, but I wanna point out that that satellite is looking through 700 kilometers of atmosphere. So we don't actually see what's happening at Earth's surface. We see the consequences of what's happening at Earth's surface. Transport or weather, if you like, has moved whatever carbon dioxide has come in or out uh, around, uh, around the globe. And so when this satellite flies, uh, it is measuring a column, an average of carbon dioxide through 700 kilometers. So, um, then uh, we need some flux inversion. In other words, we would like to invert the data that we see both in ships tracks and tall towers and uh, air, nose cones of aircraft, as well as data from, um, from this orbiting carbon observatory or GOSAT or other sources. We'd like to invert it. And um, I'd like to show you then the state equation that is used to do the inversions. There's a measurement equation, of course, and the satellite measures that measurement equation. 
and uh, let's call it Z2. Uh, what it's trying to get a hold of is the, without the measurement error due to the satellite and all the aerosols and uh, uh, the different uh, states of Earth's surface which lead to measurement error, it is trying to look at Y2, which is the true column value um, in through 700 kilometers of atmosphere. And it's in a concentration or a parts per million. Now you often hear about carbon dioxide in terms of parts per million. Um, we're at um, a little over 400 parts per million. Um, we were at 280 uh, not long ago, uh, around the time of the industrial uh, period, the industrial revolution. Um, our increases in carbon dioxide have been stratospheric um, and those increases um, uh, are attributed to our rise in temperatures. And uh, as you know, we're really very worried about climate change and carbon dioxide is one of the leading um, greenhouse gases that is causing that. Well, what we see is not what we want to get, if you know what I mean. What we want to get is this Y1, uh, which is the flux field. What we see is Z2, and that's corrupted by some bias, measurement error, and some, some integration. Um, and Y2 is got by some sort of kernel function integrated it against what we really want to get, which is Y1. So the, uh, what we, we'd like to do is solve an almost impossible problem, is, is to get back uh, to Y1. And now clearly, um, Bayesians can do everything, and so there's a Bayesian flavor to this uh, as how you would get back. Uh, let me just then talk about this uh, MIP version seven, which we've analyzed. Uh, there were nine flux inversion groups. We were not one of this group. It uh, occurred before we started working in this problem. Um, and these inversions were based on three observation types. One was the in situ data, uh, which is the ship tracks and the um, nose cones of aircraft and such. And the other two were in uh, from the orbiting carbon observatory too. And um, just for those aficionados here, you will know that land, LN means land nadir and LG means land glint. Uh, the satellite's able uh, to get better signal to noise ratio by pointing at, at glint spots, in other words, um, where the sun reflects well into the, into the satellite. Um, it has the ability to pivot, to look in different places on Earth's surface, and that's used quite extensively. So the MIP version 7 actually had three observation types, uh, land nadir, land glint, and in situ. And there were nine groups, so there are 27 outputs. So what are we going to do about it? Um, we have 27 outputs. When it comes time to uh, report what the fluxes are, uh, you don't really want to report 27 values. Um, the protocols were based uh, on this MIP version 7. Uh, by the way, there are later MIPs coming out. There's a MIP version 9 and a MIP version 10, and we are participating, our group, at uh, University of Wollongong are uh, participating in the MIP version 10. Um, uh, anyhow, in the MIP version 7, um, the data were less extensive. Um, we had monthly data then from January 2015 to December 2016. And a spatial resolution I'll show you in a minute, which is quite coarse actually. And in this uh, particular talk, we'll concentrate on one of those observation modes, the land nadir for ease of presentation. So this is the spatial resolution. There are actually uh, 16 land sites. Uh, some of the T1 through T11 uh, regions, which, which are specified by a transcom group. Um, these transcom regions, um, normally there are 11 land, uh, uh, land uh, regions, but this uh, it's been thought that we should split Northern Africa, for example, into TO5A and TO5B. I think you can see my hand there. Um, that was done as a protocol in the MIP. And actually, um, we're going to concentrate on TO5A um, in a minute. So let me just uh, show you what happens when you take these nine uh, particular um, outputs from the nine teams. Um, what's shown in gray there is the sort of variability of uh, those nine outputs. 
And the crosses show the straight average without doing anything sophisticated. Um, and that is for global land. Uh, there's not a lot of variability. By the way, um, fossil fuels have been subtracted uh, from this. Uh, so uh, we're looking at essentially the biosphere exchange. And you can see earth breathing. Uh, you can see here that uh, carbon dioxide is being released into the atmosphere and it's being drawn back in um, through photosynthesis. Um, most of the global land, of course, is in the Northern Hemisphere. So um, this does follow the seasons, the boreal seasons in the Northern Hemisphere. And you can see Earth breathing over this time. Um, global oceans uh, are much more variable. Um, you can see a lot of the nine uh, um, outputs show a lot of variability and a number of them really are tracking quite low compared to others. This is the straight average and we'll see later that this straight average actually tends to track too low because it's dragged down by um, outputs which we don't value as highly once we get into the ANOVA. Um, all right, so a little bit of stats. Um, what we really have is a, is a is a mixed effects model. Um, and to put it into a fairly generic form for which Rothamsted would be fine and for which um, climate projections would be fine and for which this, um, this OCO2 MIP would be fine. These are general ideas that we have factor combinations. In our case, season, region and observation type. And then replications within that uh, this would be for a particular month, for example, within season and within transcom region. And we would model the underlying flux for each of these combinations as some sort of climatological uh, component here, mu f, plus a random effect, which is essentially a deviation from the climatological component. And look, I've used as a summary, instead of uh, trying to put a distribution on it. I'm just going to say it has a distribution I'm going to call dist uh, with mean zero and variance tor f squared. Um, so for each combination, um, with, there are j outputs. And so we need to then uh, enhance the notation so that y f i super j is the thing that we're trying to uh, predict, um, which we'll call the consensus flux plus some sort of error, which we'll put a distribution on. And team J importantly has its own variance. So the straight average that you saw that can be um, not the best thing to do, uh, as we'll see, that straight average would assume somehow that all the variances are equal. Um, statistical inference for the ANOVA model, um, it's something within this mixed effects model that somewhat standard, um, but somewhat unknown within the geophysics community. Um, so uh, in the paper that we wrote, uh, we tended to be a little bit expos expository on about ANOVA. Um, this is very useful for something coming up called the carbon stock takes for the, for the COP26, uh, uh, which will be in Glasgow this year and later COPs. Um, what one needs to do in a stock take is work out really, um, are we in deficit or are, are we uh, you know, in excess of carbon dioxide uh, in terms of fluxes? And it's, we do not want to give um, climate modelers or policy makers nine different outputs. Uh, we want to uh, produce one. And uh, the flux group that we're working in uh, has voted uh, to produce one. Currently, the vote is for, to just use the straight average. Um, this work that we are doing, uh, we did present to them. Um, I think it was perhaps considered um, not easy, if you like. The straight average is quite easy. So uh, in order to uh, really move this along, we need to estimate parameters. We need to estimate the variance parameters and the fixed effects and basically everything that's sitting back there. And then we need to predict the underlying random consensus flux for all factors and replications. 
Um, this is a busy slide, which I won't spend a lot of time on. Um, this goes through uh, the method that we used, which was uh, to assume that dist uh, was Gaussian. Uh, and then once we did that, we we're able to write down a likelihood. And indeed, we went for a Remmel likelihood. Um, and then after some discussing and, and worrying and, and things, we realized that some sort of regularizer was needed or sometimes the sigma squares would go to, uh, to dominate. There would be a dominant uh, sigma squared and many of the other ones would be considered um, too large. So uh, what we did is put a regularizer on. It's, it's sort of a Bayesian version of regularizing the variances using a gamma distribution. Uh, one could look at it simply in terms of, of regularizing. And the choice uh, really didn't let any of these weights or sigma squares get too large or too small. So once estimated uh, for known, let's uh, say we know the underlying parameters, the best linear unbiased estimator of, of the climatological component is indeed this weighted combination. Uh, it is a fairly straightforward application of the Gauss-Markov theorem and the formulas are there, uh, but essentially when you look at this, you will see something that's quite familiar to you, that the weights, uh, which sum to one by the way, uh, those weights are inversely proportional to the variances. Um, and in a very uh, nice sort of add-on, uh, something that we can produce as statisticians is the variance of mu f star. We can do uncertainty quantification uh, we have a formula for the variance of mu f star. And again, uh, if you were to peel this back, uh, those particular formulas would be, would be quite familiar to you. <clears throat> of course, in practice, what we do is uh, we substitute in the estimates that we have for the parameters. And so we have um, a mu hat f and an s squared hat. Um, and that's what I'm gonna show you in a minute. So um, uh, this uh, prediction, um, the weighted prediction is uh, the best linear unbiased predictor. And there the climatology also gets a weight uh, if you peel it back <clears throat> and the individual outputs also get weights. Same, same story, except the uncertainty quantification now is in terms of the mean squared prediction error. Um, and there are the formula um, that we use. So um, this supernova framework, by the way, the soup is statistical unbiased prediction and estimation. Um, this supernova framework is now used in the um, MIP version seven. And this gives you some idea of the different combinations and how it's written. Um, and there on this slide is it's totally summarized. Uh, I, I won't spend a lot of time on it, but I, in red, you'll see the important quantities that we're using there um, are Y, S, R, I. Um, S is season, R is region. And the outputs are actually here in nine different attempts uh, to know what this is, this consensus flux. And J runs from one up to nine here. Okay, um, there is a wrinkle uh, in, the, in estimating the variances. Sometimes in these MIPS, particularly this one, because we only have two years of data, um, there is a wrinkle that we don't have enough replication to get decent estimates. Uh, so what we did was a K-means clustering, uh, essentially based on the underlying variances or variability of each of the groups uh, within each region and within each season. Um, then when we clustered, we end up with regions that were grouped, not based on their climatology, uh, not based on their fluxes, but based on their variability. And um, I'll show you a picture now of the sorts of groupings of regions that we came up with. So there's group one, group two, group three, and uh, group for, um, for three out of the four seasons. Uh, the seasons are December, January, February, uh, March, April, May, June, July, August, 
September, October, November. And um, the color scheme tells you group one is the most variable. You can see most of those are over land. The least variable are over the oceans. Um, and it's not totally the same uh, as, as well we might expect that the seasons might give different groupings. Um, I thought I'd uh, go to, uh, before I show you the actual uh, flux predictions that we get, I'd show you the weights. Um, of course, the, the nine groups in the MIP version seven are very interested in where they show up. Um, and generally speaking, uh, the people who like this particular scheme are the ones who get high weights. And there are others who sort of don't particularly like the way we've done it. Um, you'll notice in group four, there's a blank there um, for the weights uh, in March, April, May. Uh, that was because we only had three groups in that particular season. Um, these, um, this key uh, to the right hand side are the names of particular groups. Uh, TM5 for DVAR is the name of a group. Uh, this is you know, developed over time. University of Toronto and Edinburgh University seem to do very well, uh, according to what we've seen. Um, this is what happens for the weights uh, that uh, are attached to not only the underlying um, outputs, but also the weights that occur on the, on the climatology as well. Uh, that's relevant. Um, but most people uh, would take uh, those weights here on, on the actual um, underlying estimate of the climatology as an indication of how well one does. Um, if you were to go equal weights, then these would all be flat in every season and in every group. Um, it would be possible, and I'll mention at the end, to try to come up with a weight that's generic to that particular team. Uh, clearly what we've done here, and I think correctly, is that um, the different seasons and the different groups are going to control when weights are high and when weights are low. These are important factors um, when it comes to flux inversion. So this uh, wrinkle, if you like, I think is really important. Um, but in the end, if you're trying to say, oh, I like this particular output more than others, you might want to put some sort of combined weight over all seasons and all groups. And I'll mention something at the end. So just to recap, um, the procedure involves estimation, grouping, estimation, calculating the empirical blue, the empirical blup, and checking that the model assumptions um, are okay. We've done that. I won't show you the QQ plots. I, I took them out. Um, and in the following order, I'm going to show you some images of what's happened. I'll, I'll get back to the, um, the global land and the global ocean and show you one particular region that we, we've done all 27 regions. Um, I only really, I want to bore you with the other 26, I'll show you one that wasn't chosen to be good or bad. It was just one that uh, we happened on. Um, so let me just show you now what we see. Uh, under this scale, uh, you notice the scales are a bit different. They will be. Uh, global land shows a lot of, you can watch the earth breathe through this global land. And it might not uh, seem this way, but there is actually differences between the straight average, which is the pluses, and uh, the underlying supernova, the statistical unbiased prediction and estimation, analysis of variance uh, estimate, which is the solid line. Um, and there is actually a 95% prediction interval around that. And under global oceans, you'll see that what I suggested you might see before is that the straight average tracks low and it tracks low because there are lots of unreliable uh, outputs that we uh, deem to have high variances. And so we'll get low weights when you look at the solid line. Um, now the Transcom 050 um, 
Um, we've looked at it, obviously, you, you notice that there are a number of straight averages which are outside the 95% prediction interval, which indicates that the straight average really isn't doing the job it should, um, that the um, supernova predictions are actually uh, doing that job, and we're able to get the 95% prediction intervals around them. So I'd like to um, come to uh, my conclusions um, and then leave time for questions. Um, using this optimal ANOVA, supernova, if you like, um, uses Bayes' rule, but it's not Bayesian. Um, there are estimates going on in the parameters. Uh, sometimes in this community, it's hard to go fully Bayesian. Um, that state equation that I put up earlier that enables us to get from um, carbon dioxide concentrations through a 700 kilometer column all the way to flux inversion required using Bayes rule. Um, that's the way you do the flux inversion, it has regularization in it, of course, um, and they use the words like prior, but uh, any parameters associated with uh, models, generally speaking in the geophysics community um, are estimated. Um, we chose to go that route. Uh, it does make computation really fast. Uh, there are no MCMCs uh, involved um, in actually doing this supernova. Um, in the flux inversion we do, um, which Mike Bertolacci presented on Monday, and it's called Wombat, there is a lot of MCMC, of course. Uh, but in this particular supernova analysis, the computation's really fast. There are Bayesian versions, and I've given some references there. Um, let me jump to the fourth dot point, just to say that this would be uh, the sort of probability, the fourth dot point here where we're looking at this probability. Um, this would be uh, a sort of omnibus weight that could be applied to each model. And in fact, we're suggesting that it could be applied in a Bayesian model averaging if you had independent verification data that you could then use to update those prior probabilities of each model. Um, the third bullet I'd like to spend a little time on, some of you may have noticed there really wasn't much uh, dependence in this model. Uh, there wasn't any time series dependence. There wasn't any spatial dependence between the transcom regions. Uh, they're at a very coarse level and it might be a little um, adventurous to do that sort of spatial dependence. Uh, later MIPS, by the way, are at much finer resolution models when I think the spatial dependence is needed. But the place to put it is here in sigma gamma, uh, sigma eta, excuse me. Um, and probably more importantly than either spatial or temporal is the idea that some of these MIPS actually share, some of the components of the MIPS, they share transport models, for example. And so one could put a random effect in that captured that two particular output, two teams use the same transport model and that would lead to dependence. So um, uh, on that third point, I wanna get it back to Pat Moran. Uh, Pat is actually quite famous for a small paper that he wrote and he and modestly thinks it was just a little something. He wrote it while he was at Oxford. Um, in 1950, and since then it's spawned an enormous literature on Moran's eye statistic. And Moran's eye statistic is a, is a test statistic for testing the null hypothesis of independence versus dependence in a spatial context. And so we could use Moran's eye statistic, we haven't, um, to see if the transcom regions are the same or not. They certainly have neighborhood structures of the sort that one would need in Moran's eye statistic. So let me finish there. Um, I've got some references, um, but let me sort of move back and show you uh, sort of the bottom line of this particular piece of research. Thank you very much. I appreciate any questions you've got.